On Tuesday, December 4th, 2018, I met with members of the King County staff, including the sheriff and a shit ton of lawyers, to try and mediate the civil suit I filed against King County and Richard Rowe for this incident and the results in the internal affairs investigation that followed, where they said the only problem with how it went down was that Rowe was discourteous to me. And you know what? To my surprise, we actually came to an agreement. And I have it in my hand right now, which I'm going to discuss in this video. I think it's going to be fun. A caveat I should probably put right up front here is that there are two RCWs that I have to keep in mind when discussing the mediation that prevents me from telling you exactly what was said and some of the details of how we came to these agreements. If you've ever seen Hamilton, just think of the room where it happens. No one else was in the room where it happened, the room where it happened, the room where it happened. No one really knows how the game is played, the art of the trade, how the sausage gets made. I mean, if it was up to me, the whole thing would have been covered live on C-SPAN and posted up for everybody to watch, but... Say la vie. Also, there might be parts of this video that feel like I'm just <laughs> dunking on the sheriff's department and taking a victory lap, and... That's probably because I am, so I'm sorry if that turns you off, but... There's a lot of personal vindication for all the time, effort, stress, and pain that this situation has brought me over the last year. Almost a year ago, I got the initial findings and results back of the internal investigation. That was the first time that I realized that the sheriff's office was not going to hold Roe accountable for his actions because they had a frankly baffling perspective on what constituted force. Let's refresh what that was. So the first allegation, excessive or unnecessary use of force. Because no actual physical force was used, I find the allegation of excessive or unnecessary use of force to be unfounded. Understandably, Randall felt that having a weapon pointed at him con constituted force. This is fucking bullshit right here. This is absolute bullshit. And look, if their rules are that drawing a weapon on somebody is not force, um, that should be changed because that's absolutely ridiculous. Force is anything that you're using to stop someone or, or detain someone or doing anything. Uh, I'm not going to do anything with a gun literally on me. If you put a gun at somebody's chest and then give them instructions like, this is force. I mean, I don't care what the manual says, like, that's force. This interpretation of their general orders manual was the cornerstone of their entire conclusion after the internal affairs investigation of the incident. Given this interpretation, I was prepared for the sheriff to let Roe off with a slap on the wrist. But I thought that after that, she'd see problems with their use of force policy and be open to suggestions regarding changing it. So when the sheriff held a press conference to announce the results of the internal affairs investigation, I went down to the sheriff's office to discuss my policy suggestions. How did that go again? Then they offered up to bring me into the room, talk to me one-on-one -on -one with me and the sheriff, Mitzi Johanknik, and a woman by the name of Liz, something I believe is a chief of staff. I then asked if she thought that their use of force policy needed to change to become in line with something closer to like SPD. They were really defensive about that idea. When I pointed out that other organizations had different use of force policies that included that, the statement was basically, well, we don't have to do that, and we're not them. Liz looked at me and said, you realize that this wouldn't have happened if you wouldn't have been driving this way, that your driving led to him doing this thing, and you made a mistake, and then he made a mistake, and that led us here. I do not see those things as equatable at all. I do not see misdemeanor speeding as the equivalent to drawing and pointing a gun at somebody. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my perspective is wrong. I don't fucking think so, though. I think she is wrong. I think that attitude is wrong. Yeah, they were not at all interested in hearing what I had to say about their use of force policy then. Well, I'm happy to say that they were a lot more open to my suggestions after I sued them in federal court. I already decided that unless the sheriff was open to changing some of these policies, there was absolutely no point in considering mediation because then I'm just doing them a favor by costing them less than legal fees. My lawyer drafted up a letter and sent it over to King County's legal teams for review. And surprisingly enough, they actually seemed open to making adjustments and asked to send over a list of proposed changes relating to this case so they could run it by the appropriate teams for approval. Weird. My lawyer and I dug into the Sheriff's Department General Orders Manual and came up with what we thought were reasonable and workable adjustments to these policies. Again, I'm limited on the details on how things were discussed and when ended up on the cutting room floor of this deal. But I will say that I had a lot of other ideas for improvements. However, I understood that I only had so much leverage and that if we couldn't come to a deal, the only thing I'd get out of suing them was money and policy was more important to me. All right, let's talk about the details of this mediation. 
In my pre-mediation letter we sent to King County's representation, my lawyer laid out arguments that the Sheriff's Department's use of force policy needed to change. Quote, the video of the encounter between Roe and Randall makes clear that Roe drew his weapon immediately upon, or even before exiting his vehicle, and during the entire initial contact, Detective Roe had Randall at gunpoint. At no point was there lawful justification for Roe to point his gun at Randall. This foundational legal analysis is reflected in written policies throughout law enforcement. Just a few regional examples include the manuals of the Portland Police Bureau, San Francisco Police Department, and the Seattle Police Department. The policies of these agencies makes it clear to their officers that pointing a gun at a citizen is a use of force, which must be justified by a lawful basis, and which must be reported and evaluated through the chain of command. By contrast, the King County Sheriff's Office's General Orders Manual nowhere defines pointing a gun at a citizen as a use of force. This policy thus fails to inform deputies that pointing a gun at a citizen must be lawfully justified under the objective reasonableness standard of Graham v. Connor and under Washington law which requires that force be used only when no reasonably effective alternative to the use of force appeared to exist and that the amount of force used was reasonable to affect the lawful purpose intended. Equally troubling, the manual seems to exclude pointing a gun at citizens from the list of actions creating a duty to report a use of force. Thus, the policy as written fails to promote meaningful review of these incidents. These errors in the KCSO manual have had a predictable effect on Roe's behavior. Roe admitted to Sergeant Hawk that his gun was pointed at Randall. Because the KCSO manual fails to define pointing a gun as a use of force, Roe confirmed that he's pointed his gun at citizens on multiple prior occasions without ever understanding that he had a duty to only do so with a lawful reason, and has not reported these incidents as a use of force. The need to train officers that they must have a legal basis to point a gun at citizens is so obvious, and the likelihood that failure to do so will result in civil rights violations is so high that the King County Sheriff's Office flawed policy manual likely gives rise to municipal liability. In this case, the failure to properly define pointing a gun as a use of force in the manual was compounded by the disciplinary process, in which command staff explicitly stated that pointing a gun does not constitute a use of force subject to the requirement of objective reasonableness. In his findings and recommendations, Major Freiberger recommended a finding of unfounded under the allegation of excessive or unnecessary force. Notably, this was not because Major Freiberger believed that Roe had a legal justification for pointing a gun at Randall. Rather, Major Freiberger found that Roe's actions were unreasonable. Upon her review of Major Freiberger's findings, Sheriff Johanknik agreed that Roe had pointed his gun at Randall. However, Sheriff Johanknik determined, likely again based on flawed policies discussed above, that Roe's pointing a gun at Randall did not constitute misconduct and ordered that Roe be exonerated. This determination by Sheriff Johanknik likely creates municipal liability as a ratification of Roe's unconstitutional use of force against Randall. As a part of any settlement in this matter, KCSO policies will need change to reflect the correct legal interpretation that pointing a gun is a reportable use of force that must have legal justification, and these changes will need to be made as part of training for all deputies. This was priority one for me, and a complete non-negotiable for what needed to be changed in order to agree to any mediation resolution. This prescription for the Sheriff's Office is nothing crazy. It's simply to bring themselves in line with other law enforcement offices in the region. That's it. Seattle Police Department, for example, has it clearly lined out in their policies, so adjusting this isn't even something they have to invent whole cloth. They could easily replicate the policies of other agencies. A significant factor in Roe's reckless use of force is that pointing a gun doesn't require use of force report, meaning there's no documentation created for officers using this tactic. So, shocking to nobody, he admits that this is something he's done a number of times. Officers absolutely must be required to justify their legal reasons for drawing a firearm on somebody. And if their justifications are bad, they should be held accountable for that by whatever means are appropriate from training to termination. So buttoning this point up, the use of force policy needed to state that pointing a gun at someone is force, requires being reported whenever someone does it, and needs to have some sort of supervisory review. Here now, I'm quoting from the settlement agreement. As part of the settlement, the sheriff has given serious and thoughtful consideration to policy questions that arise out of this incident. I understand that the sheriff has recognized that aiming a weapon is a use of force, and should be reported within the Sheriff's Office subject to further consideration and evaluation by persons higher up in the chain of command. The Sheriff will be issuing a special order implementing an interim policy change by December 14th, 2018. You heard that right. After a year of dealing with this, arguing back and forth, the Sheriff has had a change of heart and does agree that pointing a gun at someone is force. I mean, is it frustrating I had to spend all this time, effort, and emotional stress to get here? Definitely. Am I relieved that after all that effort, they decided to do the right thing in this aspect? More than you can imagine. You know, this is really all I wanted from the very beginning, was to have the sheriff acknowledge what happened to me was wrong, 
and put measures in place to try to prevent it from happening to other people. And in the end, that's what she did. When the civil suit was filed, and I was talking to local reporters about it, really the only hardball question that they wanted to discuss was about monetary compensation, which I honestly hadn't thought too much about in comparison to the rest of the issues around this case. I mean, I guess it's a fair question, but I found myself surprised when they said that they thought some people were going to be angry that someone in their community had successfully litigated a government agency in federal court because they violated local and federal laws. On King County's request, my lawyer created an invoice telling up all the time and effort he spent on this case so far, and it was about $38,000. So if this actually went to trial, the cost between my lawyer's fees and my damages was going to be a lot of money, and I had absolutely no doubt I was going to win. So where do we end up on this number? Let's read again from this mediation agreement. In the consideration of payment to me of $65,000, I hereby release and forever discharge the release from all claims, demands, debts, penalties, liabilities, damages, and causes of action arising out of the August 16th, 2017 incident and all other claims that were or could have been asserted in Randall versus King County et al. U.S. District Court for the Western District, Washington, case number blah, the lawsuit. $65,000 is a lot less than what they could have paid. And in the end, I decided I was completely happy to waive a significant percentage of the potential damages that I could have extracted through the legal system for policy changes that the sheriff agreed to. To their credit, the changes they're putting in place will probably cost close to half a million dollars to develop, sign off on, run through the union, and teach their entire force. And I'd rather that money is spent implementing that. There's a 60-30 split between me and my lawyer, so it's about $40,000, which isn't trivial. Does it equate to a fair amount for all the time and effort and pain and suffering this has caused me and my family? No, but I guess it's a reasonable consulting fee for helping them identify the problems in their policy and come up with some suggestions for solutions. I still wish it hadn't happened, but I consider it about as happy of an ending as I could realistically imagine. I know that there are many people out there who express their frustrations and concerns with this incident over the last year, and I want to sincerely thank you the calls, the emails, the tweets, it all mattered and it all had a part in this change. I am going to proper celebrate this win, but I do not plan to stop here. Now that the litigation's over, I can actually start pursuing some of those other avenues with organizations that wouldn't talk to me under the litigation. This whole process has been an incredible learning experience on how to successfully litigate a claim and negotiate a change against a government entity. I'd love to create some sort of playbook or how-to to make that happen, but Realistically, these situations are often so unique and so dynamic that it's impossible to give anybody a generic step-by-step. -step. So I want to simply offer that if you or anyone you know has a situation like this happen to them, you can email me and I'll be happy to try to give you a framework to navigate this process. Also, I'd like to offer up to any organizations who think I might be able to help them in some way continue to make these reforms, reach out to me as well. For the rest of you nerds that just like to meme about motorcycles and have watched all this sideshow stuff, my R1 has a lot of miles on it, and I really need a replacement. Feel free to comment or email me with your bike suggestions. I'm definitely in the market now. I can almost afford that Lightning electric motorcycle. Or if you're interested in a 2009 R1 with 45,000 miles in the Seattle area that has this tendency to attract cops, hit me up too. As always, ride fast and take chances. Law and the law lost. I thought the law and the law lost.